So, um, we're doing very well in transforming ourselves into a chemist. But, of course, uh, nothing will be complete without talking about precipitation yet. So today, you're going to know about this as well. We started talking about chemicals in the water, aqueous solutions, and about reactions that happen in solutions. And so the, the, the last few items uh, in this course are three types of reactions. And so today we'll be talking about precipitation reactions. Uh, and then on Friday, acid base reactions. And actually we'll continue that into next week. So we'll do a couple of calculations with acid base titrations. And then the last, very last topic in this class overall is redox reactions. And redox reactions will be a couple of lectures. And we do some extensive uh, complications with redox reactions. And that's it. Then the course is done. Okay. The only thing you have to do is a midterm and a final, and then you'll be you'll be happy. Okay. I mean that's just okay. So today, precipitation reactions. Who knows already what that is? Who knows what the precipitation reaction is? Ah, all right. I'm telling you something new. Fantastic. Here we go. In a precipitation reaction, the following is going on. I have, for instance, a solution uh, which is a aqueous solution. Uh, that means that the uh, compounds are fully dissolved in water. Okay, so in this particular case, it is barium nitrate. And again, I want to remind you that in the solution, you don't see anything. You don't see barium nitrate if you look at it because the individual ions are dissolved by water. Okay? So that really means that these ions are separate entities in the solution. If I add another solution to it, so I have two beakers, and I can pour one into the other one. That's what I'm going to do. This is potassium chromate. Okay, potassium chromate. It's a little yellowish because of the chromate anion. Okay. So this is also a clear solution. It has a color, but it's clear. You don't see solid chunks floating around because each ion is fully dissolved by a water layer. But if I put these things together, something funny happens. I see this. First of all, the volume gets twice as much. That is to be expected, of course. But secondarily, you see some yellow solid at the bottom. Okay, so I have two solutions which are completely dissolved. I mean, there's nothing there to see, no solid material. But when I put them together, I have solid material. Okay, we call that solid material a precipitate. Because it pre precipitates out of the solution. It was in solution, now it has formed a solid piece of material. So what is happening here? Well, we'll find out. Okay, but this is a typical example of a precipitation reaction. It means that out of the solution you precipitate a component or a compound that is solid and does not dissolve in the solution anymore. Okay? Alright, so intuitively what do you think is going on? Well, a reaction happens. I have two solutions. These are, these are ions in them. And these ions are fully dissolved. But apparently, when I throw them together, some of these ions hook up with another ion to form a compound that is not dissolving very well, and hence precipitates out. So what I really want to know here is what dissolves very well and what does not dissolve very well. And if everything dissolves very well, if all ionic compounds fully dissolve, I would not be able to see a precipitate in this experiment. All right? So I'm going to walk through this table. This is a solubility table, and that will be very important for our discussion. Okay, so I'm going to ask myself which salts are having a very high solubility, and which salts, which ionic compounds, do not have a very high solubility. Okay, so here is the first part of the table. It's empty yet. 
Okay? This half says soluble. So that means everything that falls in this, in this column here is a ionic compound that is soluble in water. Okay, so alkali metal ion compounds, that means these are ionic compounds that have in them a lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, or cesium ion. Okay? So when this ion is part of the compound, so when that ion is a cation of the ionic compound, then the compound is uh, having a high solubility in water. The ammonium ion, when that binds to something else, an anion, it leads to a compound that also dissolves well in water. Okay. So ammonium compounds, which means a compound that has the ammonium ion in it as a cation, is something that dissolves well in water. On the anionic side of things, if you have a ionic compound that has the nitrate anion, bicarbonate, which is HCO3 minus, or chlorate, okay, so the chlorate is basically the chlorate anion, ClO3 minus. These compounds, when they team up with a cation, they form an ionic compound, and that compound is going to be well dissolved in water. It's a high solubility. Halides also have a high solubility. Halides are compounds where the anion is Co minus, Br minus, or iodine. The iodine ion. I minus. However, if these halides team up with silver, and this is mercury, this is the interesting form of mercury. Mercury 1, oxidation state 1, is a dimer of two mercury ions of two mercury atoms, but together have a charge of two plus, remember? A very exotic situation. But when you encounter one of these guys, when these guys team up with halides, they actually form something that is insoluble in water. And the same holds for lead-2 compounds. So lead-2 with a halide is not something that dissolves well. Other cations dissolve very well with halides, but these three do not. So this is an exception, that's why it falls in the exception column. And then finally, sulfates are generally very soluble. Okay, so when you form an anion compound that has the sulfate anion in it, then that compound is likely to dissolve well with water. However, there are exceptions once again. The exceptions are this. When sulfates team up with a cation that is a silver, uh, calcium, strontium, barium, this is Again, mercury 1, oxidation state 1, which is a dimer, or uh, lead again, lead 2. Uh, these cations, when they combine with this anion, are forming salts that are not soluble in water, or have a very low solubility. Okay? So these are basically, this is the column of soluble materials with these exceptions. But below it, I can do the following. I can look at things that are always in soluble. If you form a compound that has a carbonate as the anion, okay, then typically it is insoluble. Same for chromate, phosphate, or sulfides. So when this is part of your ionic compound, then likely this compound is going to be insoluble in water. However, there are exceptions again. And you can already see what kind of exception these are. Because here I said, without any exceptions, if you form something with alkali metal ions, it is soluble, including these. Okay? So when you form, when you team these guys up with these two guys, the ammonium cation or these cations, they will be soluble. In other words, actually, alkali metal ions always form soluble compounds. Highly soluble. And then finally, hydroxides are generally insoluble in water. Of course, there are exceptions. Again, alkali metal ions is the exception, as before. But also, interestingly, the barium 2 plus cation. So, barium 2 plus with an OH minus, barium OH2. 
is actually a compound, very much also as a compound in the source one on one. Now, a quick note, why is this so? Why is this, what did you say that you're completely arbitrary? Well, let's get to a little bit of physical grounding here. What is going on, of course, is what are the binding forces between the ions, that form, relative to the forces of the water that we hang on them. Okay, remember? Something dissolves well in water, and the water encapsulates the ions. And when those forces are stronger than the forces in the lattice that bind the ions together, then it dissolves. However, as you can see in this table, there is a sliding scale. Some of the compounds, the insoluble compounds, have lattice forces in the ionic compound that are too strong for the water to break. Okay? So it will not dissolve in water. But vice versa, I can say, if I have two solutions together, and, I, and in these two solutions there are two ions that can form a carbonate, for instance, or a chromate, not with this, but with another, another cation, then the forces between these ions will be stronger than the water that keeps them apart, and they will form a lattice. They will form an ionic compound, which is a solid. Okay? So it's a subtle balance between ionic binding forces and the dissolving forces of the water molecule. That's the balance, and there is a sliding scale, as you can see. Importantly, you got polymetal compounds, are small, typically small cations, okay, single charge, and they have a very high affinity for water. They like to be encapsulated by water, and consequently their lattices easily break down, and you will not be able to form a new lattice from solution with these polymetal So they, they lead to high, highly soluble salt. Okay, now, let's put this into practice and solve that first uh, uh, chemical reaction that we looked at on slide ago. We had barium nitrate and potassium chromate. Those were the two solutions we threw together and we saw a precipitate. One of these combinations of the ions led to an insoluble compound. Which one is it? Okay, so, let's look at what kind of ions do we have in solution. Okay, well, I have potassium chromate and barium nitrate. So I have potassium ions, chromate anions, barium cations, and nitrate anions. These are the ions I have in my solution. The next question is, can I make new combinations of these ions? So basically, teaming up cations with anions. See what kind of combinations I can make. What kind of compounds can I possibly make? And is one of these compounds an insoluble compound? If yes, then that may be that recipient. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make combinations. So let's make combinations. You can make a total of four compounds of this. Why? Because the cation can team up with two types of anions. Okay, and this cation can also team up with two types of cations. So it's a total of four compounds. It has to be a neutral compound. So here are neutral compounds I can form. These are all the possible combinations. I can make potassium chromate, potassium nitrate, barium chromate, and barium nitrate. Those are the four possibilities I can make with these four ions. Okay? The cation always has to team up with an anion. All right. Well, I see immediately that, hold on a second, these two guys are my starting materials are reactants. So these cannot be the precipitate because they were already in solution and they dissolved well. These were clear solutions. Right? So these reactants are not going to be my insoluble compound. So either one of these guys is going to be my precipitate, my insoluble compound. Okay? So these are the possible precipitates. Which one is it? Well, I have to look at that table we just went through. And Try to find out which one of these is insoluble. Okay, so uh, <coughs> potassium nitrate cannot be a precipitate. Why not? Potassium is an octonomic ion. Okay? These are highly soluble materials. And on top of that, the nitrate anion also leads to soluble materials. So potassium nitrate cannot be the precipitate. And consequently, the other guy has to be the precipitate. Let's check if that makes sense. Barium chromate, 
chromate was in this table of insoluble compounds. So uh, compounds formed the chromate anion are generally insoluble. Okay? This is another column metal ion. Barium, so barium chromate, is the precipitate here. Here it is. That's barium chromate, beautiful yellowish salt that precipitates out of solution. So what I have then is the following. This is potassium chromate, barium nitrate. Both are fully dissolved. They have this aqueous phase. And then after the reaction, what I have is barium chromate, which is now a solid. Okay? It did not dissolve in water, so it's a solid. And I have this part, which is still in solution. This is potassium nitrate. Okay? So the nitrate from the barium is now floating around in solution, as is the potassium ion. They are still fully dissolved. Okay. Precipitate, and this is still dissolved. Let's look at another example. Here's one. When a silver nitrate solution is mixed with potassium chloride, you see white precipitate, like here. Okay, so I have, let's say, I have a silver nitrate solution, which is a clear solution, and I've put a few drops of potassium chloride in there, suddenly you see these white clouds forming. White clouds mean small little particles, okay, and these particles are solid little chunks. Something doesn't dissolve well. What is that? What is the precipitate? Okay, so we can now go through this. Uh, first, we'd like to understand what are the ions in solution. Okay, so silver nitrate, potassium chloride, the following ions are present. Silver, nitrate, potassium and chlorine ions, all floating in solution. Next question, which combinations I can make? Okay, so let's see. Let's list all the possible combinations I can make. So each cation combining with the two possible anions. I find four solutions. Silver nitrate, silver chloride, potassium nitrate, and potassium chloride. Again, the first and the last are the reactants. They cannot be the precipitate because I started out with clear solutions. So either one of these are the possible precipitates. Let's find out which one it is. Well, I see immediately this guy is the same as before. Uh, this one really, really dissolves well in water. This guy must be it. Silver, yes? Um, how do you identify, um, how do you identify the possible precipitate again? Okay. How do you identify all the possible combinations? Yeah. There is one cation. The cation can only hook up with an anion. How many anions are there? Two. So it can hook up with Nitrate and chlorine. That's two possibilities. Then we're going to the next cation. That's potassium. We can hook up with two anions. The same. Nitrate and chlorine. Those are all possibilities. There's nothing left. There's no extra cations, nor anions. You make every combination possible. Okay, so I mean, I already noticed that potassium nitrate cannot be a precipitating salt. It dissolves extremely well in water. The dissolving forces of water are really good. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> All right. So the precipitate must be the other guy, which is silver uh, chlorine. Chlor chloride, sorry. Silver chloride. So this is the reaction. This is what you should be able to write down then. Let's pretend this is an exam. So you write down this. Silver nitrate plus potassium chloride. Both have the aqueous phases. And then after the reaction, you see that one of them is precipitating out. That is the silver chloride, which we just put it. It requires an S and potassium nitrate. Of course, it's still a solution, so it still has this AQ symbol behind it. OK. Now, uh, let's look, look a little bit closer at this reaction here and see if we can... Oh, there's one more example, sorry. Let's do this one quick. Same, same kind of story. Potassium iodide and lead nitrate. Put two solutions together, identify which is the precipitating salt. Okay, so I'll do it very quick. 
Potassium iodide has potassium and iodine ions. Lead to nitrate has lead to cations and nitrate anions. Okay. And then what I really, what I really want to do is I can make all four combinations again, but already now I don't really need to look at the reactants. Okay. So there's really just two new possibilities. What, what are those two possibilities? Well, it's like this guy open up with this. And this guy, we're going to put that guy. Right? Those are the only new possibilities I can make. I can, again, have potassium and iodine go together, but that's already what I have. Those are the precipitating salts. So the pre 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 precipitating compound can only be led to iodide or potassium nitrate. OK? So you need an ion exchange. So the new combinations are these two. and. For some reason, that's an that keeps popping up. Okay? This one, again, is not it. This one must be it. Lead to iodide. Now, lead to iodide is indeed a compound that doesn't dissolve well. Why not? Because halides, which are compounds that form with CO minus, VO minus, or I minus, if they hook up with lead to, as we saw in the table as an exception, they will not dissolve. So, indeed, Halides of Pb2 plus are insoluble, and hence this here is going to be nitrogen. Here it is, also a really wonderful yellow. Okay, just gray. Chemistry is gray, beautiful colors, nice smells. Okay, so this is the reaction then, balanced in this case. I see a potassium iodide, lead nitrate, both are fully dissolved in water. Nitrate dissolve well, including with lead. Okay, so that's a compound that's fully dissolved. And then after the reaction, again, potassium nitrate fully dissolved, but lead iodide, lead to iodide, is not, it is not S in the solvent. It's a precipitate. Okay. Now, let's take this reaction and look at it a little bit more closely. Close up. So here it is, the same reaction that we just found. The way in which you write this is called a molecular equation. Why? Because I list here this compound, Ki, as if it were a compound where the K and the I are together still. I just say aqueous, which means they are actually fully dissolved. Okay, so there's two pieces of information here. It's like potassium and iodide are in the compound and they're dissolved. However, we do know that in reality, the potassium and the iodine are not really together because they're dissolved, they're separate ions floating in solution. Okay? <coughs> so this equation here tells you only part of the story. You have to realize that this aqueous symbol doesn't mean that potassium and nitrate on this side here are stuck together. They're not. They're just both present in solution. So another way of writing the same equation here is to explicitly tell the reader that these ions are fully dissolved. And you can do that in the following way. Okay? This is called the complete ionic equation. I spell out precisely which ions are dissolved. So instead of writing 2 times Ki, I write 2 K plus aqueous and 2 I minus aqueous. That's the same. This is the same as that. But I explicitly write the ions are dissolved as individual entities. And the same holds for lead to nitrate. Lead to ions are explicitly written and the nitrate anions too. Now note, there's a 2 here, of course, because there was a 2 there. And that's why there's a 2 there, because you have to balance out. So on the other side, I have to do the same thing. The potassium nitrate is actually potassium ions here, nitrate ions there, so I can write it the same way. Okay, potassium ions is all, nitrate ions is all. This guy, of course, is a solid. I cannot split that. This is really physically these guys are together. And so lead to iodide is given as one compound in S to solid. So this is very accurate. Okay, the net of the equation tells you exactly what's in the solution, but it can be rather long. And so there's a third way of writing the same equation. And that is 
called the net analytic equation. What I'm doing in the net analytic equation is I'm leaving out all the ions that appear on both sides. For instance, potassium is here, potassium is also there. Nothing happens to it. I can call this a spectator ion. It just sits on both sides of the equation, it doesn't react, doesn't change. Okay, so I don't have to list it. It's not really relevant for the chemistry that's taking place. So the last way of writing the same equation, therefore, is the net field equation, where I leave out all the spectator ions. And I list only those ions that actually undergo a physical change. Namely, lead and iodine form lead to iodine. The spectator ions were potassium, okay, which didn't do anything, and nitrate, which remained in solution at all times. So I can leave that out. That's what I did. Potassium nitrate is only here. They were spectator ions. So if you have a chance of crossing out ions on both sides of the equation, those ions are called spectator ions, do not partake in chemical changes, chemical or physical changes, and therefore you can leave them out. And the result is the net the only equation. Depending on the problem, you may choose to work with molecular, ionic, or net ionic equation. Okay? Depending on what the problem asks you. We'll see a couple of examples where we'll actually be using the net ionic equation because that tells you exactly the stoichiometry of the reacting parts. Okay? Okay, let's practice this a little bit. So the question is: give the molecular a complete ionic and the net ionic equations of this reaction. This is a typical question on an exam, okay? Because there's several things that are being tested here. Because everything is written out in words, the first step you have to be able to do is to translate the words into a chemical formula, right? Then you have to balance the equation, number two. And number three is you have to be able to make the difference between Molecular complete and net ionic. Alright, so let's see if we can do that. Potassium hydroxide is one of the reactants. It's mixing with iron 3 nitrate, and the precipitate that forms is iron 3 hydroxide. So the precipitate is already given, but if we figure it out. Okay, so let's figure out what the reactants are and what the um, products are. On the reactant side, I find potassium hydroxide, that's this guy, KOH, and iron 3 has a charge plus 3, nitrate charge minus 1. That means I need 3 nitrates. That's why there's a 3 there. Okay? So this is iron 3 nitrate. Both are dissolved in water, so they have this aqueous symbol. When I put them together, the precipitate forms. Which one is that? Well, it's given iron 3 hydroxide. Okay. Iron 3 hydroxide is the, uh, the ions that actually precipitate. It means the OH is gone. The iron is used. The nitrate does not precipitate with potassium. So potassium nitrate is still in solution. So the way to write that is the precipitate, iron, OH, 3. OH has charge minus. Iron has charge 3 plus because it's iron 3. That means 3 hydroxides are needed to make a neutral compound. This is S. And I have three potassium nitrates to balance the equation. Okay, so there's several things you have to be able to do. Balance the equations, recognizing the chemical formulas, and to write this properly as a molecular equation. OK. Try to distinguish these types of equations always again. This is something you can just learn to do right. On the exam, people always make mistakes. I ask for a net ionic, and I get this. Don't do that. Just study that and just make sure you read the question. There's no reason to make a mistake uh, on these things. They're just conventions. The conventions are things you just learn. Same equation, now complete ionic. What is the difference? The difference is that each ion that is dissolved is specifically listed. Okay? So here, three potassiums, three hydroxides. Okay? All of them are aqueous. Iron nitrate is also fully dissolved, that means that iron 3 plus are floating around and nitrates are floating around. So these are the uh, reactants. On the product side, this guy, the precipitate, is not splitting into ions, of course. It's the precipitate, right? 
these guys are not individual, they are together in a lattice. So this guy stays as one compound, iron 3 hydroxide S, as an solid. And potassium nitrate, once again, is fully dissolved in water, and that's why you take this symbol. Okay. The last thing I have to do is to look at the net ionic equation. What is that again? Spectator ions cross out. Okay, which one of the spectators? Potassium is. 3K plus, 3K plus. Cross, cross. How about OH minus? Can I cross this out? No, I can because it's part of this. It's not freely floating in solution on the other side. I cannot cross it out. How about iron? Nope, sir. Cannot do it. There it is. Nitrates? Yes. Out here, out there. Okay? Same here on both sides. Those go away. What I'm left with. These are the spectator ions, okay? Spectator simply means you're just watching what's happening. These are the ions, don't do anything, okay? The iron and the oxide will all work. So, what I'm left with is OH minus and iron 2 plus. Of course, there's a 3 there because there's a 3 here to make a neutral compound, iron 3 hydroxide. This is the net ionic equation. All spectator ions have been taken out. By the way, iron hydroxide is a nasty little compound you on it in your backyard. And it happens sometimes near uh, coal mines. Uh, there's a lot of acid acidic waste. This is a byproduct that forms in uh, wastewater. Okay. Not nice, not pretty. It looks like humans do wonderful things in nature. Okay, so now let's put all these things together and do some calculations with them. Okay, so this question combines what we just learned, which is recognizing a precipitate, of course, writing an equation, precipitation uh, equation, and then using the stoichiometric calculation tricks that we used before. So in other words, I, I should be able to calculate what is the mass of precipitate that I form when I throw, throw, when I throw two things together? Okay? So that's what we're trying to do. Let's look at the following example. It says, calculate the mass of calcium sulfate, which is a precipitate that forms when two solutions are put together. The first solution is calcium nitrate, and the second solution is sodium sulfate. These are the starting solutions. This one here and that one there. The number of moles is not given, but what is given, though, is the volume and the molarity. And if you remember, volume times molarity is number of moles. Okay? N equals V times M. So keep that in mind. We need it. Okay, so I have to calculate the mass. This is the product. So I have to calculate the mass of a product like I did before. Calculating the mass of a product through mole ratio. So we just did last week. I'll do it again just with precipitation reaction. This is the product. It's already given. So how do I start with this? First, I want to understand what the reaction is all about. Okay? So let's just look at what is in the pot. In the pot is the reagent, which has sodium, it's plus should go up, subscript, uh, superscript, and sulfate, and calcium nitrate gives you these ions in solution. And you can make two new combinations, namely calcium sulfate and sodium nitrate. Okay, of these two combinations, calcium sulfate is a precipitated salt. You can get that from the table, okay, because sulfates usually dissolve well, except with certain cations among which calcium. So this is an exception, and therefore insoluble. But fortunately for me, it's also given here already. Well, I can be sure this one here is not precipitated. Okay. Knowing that calcium sulfate is precipitate, I can now directly jump to the net ionic equation. Because sodium is going to be a spectator ion, and the nitrate also. I don't need to list sodium or nitrate. It doesn't matter. What does matter is how many calcium I have and how many sulfate I have. So, in other words, I can write this. Calcium 2 plus plus 
SO4 to minus sulfate form the precipitate, calcium sulfate. And I have to calculate how much of this do I form. So the only thing you have to know is, well, the only thing, what you have to know is which one of these two guys, calcium ions or sulfide ions, is the limiting reagent. That ion is going to determine how much of this you form in your pot. OK, so let's find out which one is the limiting reagent. What do you need to do for that? Look at the ratios. Just look at the balance ratio and the electromole ratio. So we calculate how many moles of calcium ions we have, how many moles of sulfide ions we have. Calcium 2 plus, what do I do? Oh, look at this. All the calcium must come from this compound, calcium nitrate. OK? So the number of moles of calcium nitrate gives me how many moles of calcium I have. Each calcium nitrate molecule, this calcium nitrate compound unit, has one calcium 2 plus to cover. OK? So if I calculate the number of moles, which means volume times molarity, I get the number of moles of calcium 2 plus ions. Okay? 0.5 liters times this molarity, okay? 0 .0, uh, 0 0.05. This is the definition of molarity, right? Moles per liter. This is molarity. If you do the multiplication, you find 0 0.0250 moles of calcium nitrate. And each calcium nitrate gives you one calcium. So this is immediately the number of moles of calcium 2 plus. Same for the sulfates. There it is. All the sulfates must come from sodium sulfate. And each sodium sulfate unit has one sulfate to offer. So that means if I determine the number of moles of this compound, I know how many moles of sulfate I have. What do I have to do? Multiply liters with molarity. Let's do that. Volume times molarity equals number of moles equals number of moles. And if you do the multiplication, you find 2 times 0 0.2, sorry, 0 0.0200 equals 0 0.0400. That's how many moles of sulfate ions I have in the solution. OK, so now I can do the ratioing. How did it work again? It works like this. The equation says for each one mole of calcium, I need one mole of sulfate. So they react one to one. Each mole of calcium is one mole of sulfate. The ratio, the mole ratio from the equation is one. What is the actual? Okay, number of moles of calcium, number of moles of sulfate. That ratio is less than one, which means our body calcium is the limiting component in my solution. So what I then do is I take the limiting reagent, calcium ions, the number of moles of that, and then convert that into a number of moles of the product. This is the same thing we did before. Calcium is a limiting reagent. The other guy, sulfate, is the one in excess. So to calculate the number of moles of the product, what I do, I start with the number of moles of the limiting reagent and convert that into the number of moles of the product. Okay? For each one mole of calcium, I generate one mole of calcium sulfate. That's what the equation says. Calcium sulfate is one calcium sulfate. It's all one 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 so one to one So it's one to one. Okay? And that means that I form 0 0.0250 moles of calcium sulfate precipitate. That's how many moles of precipitate you form. And the very last step I have to do is to convert moles into grams, because they want to mass. How do we do that? How does that work? Yes, times the mole mass of what? Of calcium sulfate. Yeah, times the mole mass of calcium sulfate. You know the number of moles of calcium sulfate? You convert it into grams, and you can multiply that the mole mass of calcium sulfate. So let's do that. The number of moles, I just calculated this, times the molar mass, which you have to calculate from the periodic table, right? And then the your multiplication, you find the final solution, 3.4 grams of calcium sulfate. So, these calculations are very, very similar to the ones you did last week. Only difference is 
with a specific kind of reaction, a precipitation reaction. Make sure you can recognize what the precipitate is. Make sure you can write a net of equation that will be helpful in your stoke geometry. Don't get lost in the forest. When it comes to spectator eyes, they don't partake in the reaction. So don't have to worry about that. So make sure you have a better equation. Those are only reading for successful calculations. See you on Friday. Thank <laughs> you.